Well, praise the Lord. It's uh, such a privilege to be here um, at this annual convention and to minister to you all the way down from Glasgow. I drove down uh, this morning in a pleasant drive and um, already I've been blessed uh, being in this place and, and hearing the singing and hearing the wonderful message that uh, Kyle brought to us. And so um, it's such a privilege to be here, uh, as I said, and to bring the word of the Lord. Could you turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, please? 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm trying to find my notes here. 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're going to read uh, from verse 1, not the whole chapter again, because uh, time does not permit, but we will read quite a bit into it. 2 Kings chapter 2, from verse 1. <coughs> And another famous story from God's word. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it, hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it, hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by, they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. What's, uh, it's a great message, a great story here. So much to tell us, and particularly when we're considering this theme of revival, and will he revive us again? And I believe the Lord wants us to see some things in this passage that he wants to teach us about our expectations for revival, because I think a lot of our expectations for revival uh, are not shaped by God's word or indeed by the spirit of God, but by the thinking of men and carnal ideas about revival. Um, and we need to turn to God's word and see what God has to say about moves of God and how they are passed on. And when we think of that word succession, uh, and um, I teach and leadership at Bible College up in Glasgow. And quite a bit of the teaching that we look at is the succession, the succession of anointing, the succession of mantles. 
And <clears throat> when we think about Moses and how Moses' leadership of the nation of Israel was passed on to Joshua, when we look at how uh, Samuel is the last judge of Israel, his, uh, the leadership of Israel again passed on to Saul, and indeed from David to Solomon, all the different parts of God's word where, where God has moved, then it's passed on. And we need to understand when we're talking about revival, what God has to say about moves of God and how they're meant to be stewarded. Uh, and they're meant, there's meant to be a succession. And we see a wonderful succession here. We see that this man, Elisha, receives the mantle of Elijah. And of course, that's very pertinent because when we think about Jesus, Jesus said that if you receive it, John the Baptist was in that spirit and mantle of Elijah. And indeed, we can even say that in the last days, uh, when we think about the book of Malachi, uh, there's going to be a great Elijah move in the last days. And so we need to be looking for that because I believe that the revival that is to come is the greatest revival in the history of this planet. And greater than every other revival and awakening and outpouring that we've had up to now. And we speak a lot about that. Uh, we were speaking earlier about things like the Welsh revival, the Lewis revival, uh, great moves of God. But we have to ask, why did they not continue? Why do we talk about them uh, in a historic tense? And why do we, why do we uh, look back for the last great move of God and not forward? Because this man, Elisha, this man, Elisha, broke all the ministerial protocols. <laughs> he had no, uh, none of the, the humility of a churchman. Uh, well, you know, Elijah, if I can just carry on your work, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad, I'll be grateful. All, all I want to do is just carry on the legacy that you've handed over. No, this man, Elisha, had the audacity. And I would say it was a holy boldness and audacity to say, well, Elijah, you are a great man of God, and under you, you've transformed the nation. But I want double. I want double what's on you. You've said to me, I can ask what from, from you. What, and you notice he didn't even say, you can ask it from the Lord. He says, ask what, what I can give you. And he said, I want double what's on you, and I want to walk in the double. And of course, we know that Elisha did that. It was indeed the mantle of Elijah. And this phrase has been jumping out at me um, and we'll look at this where he says Elijah uh, Elisha when he when Elijah went off in the whirlwind Elisha didn't say well you know what um, I've got some of Elisha, Elijah's um, personal effects I've got some of his cloaks I've got, uh, I've got his drinking cup I've got his old King James Bible <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to build a monument and we're going to have a gift shop and, <clears throat> and people can come, we'll have a wee museum and but they can see Elijah's artefacts and we can build a ministry around that. Now that's, that tends to be, I think, how many of us have stewarded revivals of the past. You know, we, 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 don't, we, we, we look back and say, oh, what about that great move of God? But see, Elisha didn't have that spirit about him. What he did was he said, he picked up Elijah's mantle and he said, he didn't say, what can we do with this? You know, how much can we charge people to come and see this? <laughs> or I can make a ministry. Well, listen, I was, I was Elijah's right-hand man, you know. <laughs> no, he said this, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Amen. He wanted the anointing he wanted the mantle and the anointing and the glory that Elijah walked in, but he was greedy. He wanted double. And so his heart was to see the glory of God in the land in a double portion what Elijah walked in. And you and I, brothers and sisters, today, whilst we do, we all shall be, you know, I, I come from, and funnily enough, uh, the church that I pastor uh, in Glasgow is called Zion City. Just like we've sung Zion City of Our God. Um, and, uh, but its old name is uh, the Foundry Boys, which was a children's ministry. It uh, was started uh, over 150 years ago. Um, and the, uh, its peak 20,000 children were in that ministry 
in various branches. In fact, I think we even had one down in Sheffield. And then it, it morphed into a church. And for many, many years, it was packed. And a great move of God, many people saved, uh, and so on, in that ministry. And we have, you know, we have artifacts, we have things in the church, a wee bit like yourselves, you can come and look at all the different things that we have. And it is right to honour, isn't it? It's right to honour what God has done in the past. It's right to honour men of God in the past who walked under a mighty anointing. It's right in a sense, and I mean it in the right way, it's right for us to have heroes of the Christian faith. Uh, you know, and I, I, I'm glad to say today that when I was from a, a young boy, uh, Kyle's father was one of my heroes uh, as a leader and a preacher and a man of God in this nation. And it's right to do that. And we certainly must honour them because I don't believe you can walk in revival power if you don't honour what God has done in the past. But brothers and sisters, we don't, build monuments, and we don't create shrines. And I have to say this, uh, in, in Protestantism very often, we've venerated these men that have got almost like, like Catholics do, they, they venerate saints, don't they? And we put these people on a pedestal. But I believe if we, they were here today, they would be saying to us, don't build a museum for me, don't build a monument for me, don't bask in my gl glories, I'm passing the baton over to you. And that's exactly what Elijah did here for Elisha. He says, if you can see me when I go, and he threw the mantle down, and Elisha picked it up, and he didn't say, oh, yes, what can I do with this? How can I promote my ministry with this mantle? He said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He picked up the baton, and he said, it's time to do the work of God. And it's time for revival again. Now, of course, he says, he says, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Think about this, the great move of God that happened under Elijah. And let's not minimize that. You know, Elijah was the prophet who called down fire. God, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And we think that's a wonderful miracle. And of course it is. And Elijah was a great showman. He said, fill up the trenches with water so that nobody can say that, you know, that we had fire under it. The place, the sacrifice was soaked with water. But what's the greatest miracle of that story? Is it that the fire from heaven fell? Well, let's, let's face it, that was a wonderful miracle. But was it also that over 400 men lined up to be killed by Elijah? Meekly stood there as he slaughtered the prophets of Baal. Mm -hmm. And let me just say this, you and I need to see the prophets of Baal slaughtered in our day. I don't mean that in a literal way, of course. I'm speaking metaphorically. We need to see Baalism and Babylon and Jezebel and, and, and all the woke ideology and all the isms. We need to see those idols topple and we need to see the, those prophets slain before us. And I don't, again, I emphasize anyone's hearing this, we're not talking about literal slaying. We're talking about the, the defeat and destruction of ideology and culture that is opposed. And we, we have to have, if we're going to have revival, we have to see these idols topple. So Elijah presided over that. He was the man that God used. And of course, you can see here all the prophets, they were uh, subservient in a sense to the Elijah ministry. They were being trained in it. And so much so that the spirit of Elijah that was upon him, they were picking up the same thing. Elijah knew he was going off to heaven and they were getting that as well from the, the prophetic, but of course, and Elisha knew it, and here's the thing, think about this, if that great move of God was about to leave the earth, and you and I lament sometimes, don't we, oh, if we could only go back to the days of the Welsh revival, if we could only go back to that time that we knew, uh, uh, Kyle and I were speaking earlier about the, the tent hall in Glasgow, a famous place where many, many uh, for many years, people would come and get saved, but also Christians would be galvanized. A great move of God. It's now flats, brothers and sisters. And you say, oh, if you could only go back to the days of the tent hall, if you could only back, go back to that time and this time. And these people were witnessing the removal from the earth of a mighty move of God, which was headed up by this man, Elijah. And, you know, we could, they could fall into despair. But look at God's ways here and this is what i want us to see the bible says that god uh, revealed his ways to moses but his acts to the children of israel 
If we want to see revival, we need to know the ways of the Lord. And I'll tell you what God's ways are. It's that when God moves on from a move of God, he increases and at least doubles that which he has done. And we, but only if someone will pick up the mantle. You and I need to be picking up the mantle later. It's, it, it, where is the Lord God of George Whitfield? Where is the Lord God of John Wesley? Where is the Lord God, uh, Pastor Norman says, of John Knox? It's not another John Knox we need. It's the God of John Knox that we need. It's not another uh, Ian Paisley that we need. It's not a, another, um, you know, uh, what's, uh, Evan Roberts that we need. It's the God of these men. It's the message of these men. The message doesn't die with these men. And the anointing doesn't die as we've seen the mantle carries on. There's a baton to be passed. And I would encourage you and exhort you this day, brothers and sisters, that rather than just say, well, you know, let's talk about the past. Let's talk about the mantle and pick up that mantle and say the revival that we seek, the revival that Kyle has mentioned, the revival that we're here to discuss, the revival that we're here to believe and pray for. Let's, let's believe that that revival is ahead of us and that we're stepping into it and we're going to see a mighty move of God in the land. And why else are we here? Why did I drive all the way down from Scotland if it wasn't for a people hungry for revival? We have a, a meeting uh, every Saturday, which I've missed today. A friend stood in for me uh, in my, my home church. And again, it's called The Gathering. And that's what we, we meet for every Saturday morning. I don't get in my bed on a Saturday morning just to have breakfast with Christian friends. We meet because we're positioning for revival. We're positioning for a move of God. And these wonderful, uh, this wonderful passage tells us that all it takes to have a move of God in the earth greater than any move before it. I mean, who would argue that? I mean, Moses, Elijah, but Elijah was certainly up there. And instantly... When Elijah goes, instantly, not well, they had to tarry and pray for 20 years and so on. Instantly, they stepped into double what Elijah walked in. And I believe that God's saying to you and I today, let's not just celebrate the past. Let's not just honor the great men of old, the John Wesleys and so on. But let's step into what they left behind. Let's pick up the mantle. You know, the mantle's still there. The call is still there. Um, the mission is still there. When Moses uh, passed on, God said to Joshua, get up and take this children across the Jordan and go into the promised land. The mission never changed. The mission has not changed. No matter who dies, no matter who gets taken to heaven in a whirlwind, no matter what happens, you and I are tasked with the same mission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and disciple nations. Go and take this territory for Jesus. Now, yeah, we can talk about the, the second coming. We can talk about the rise of Antichrist and the great and gross darkness. Isaiah chapter 60. Look around you, it says. The great darkness. The gross darkness upon the people. But what does it say? Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord will be seen upon you. That is the message I believe that God would have us to take today. Not just today and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other messages coming forth. Because I don't believe this is just an ordinary gathering of folks. I believe that God wants to implant and impart something in us. And it's that, not just a hunger for God to move. See, part of the problem as well and I, I share this a lot with the folks up in Scotland, is that when we talk about revival, for a lot of people, they just think that one day we're going to see revival. <laughs> that one day we're going to wake up and God will zap us. We're waiting for the zap, aren't we? We're waiting for God just to one day, you say, well, one day we're going to be in revival. Well, brothers and sisters, Elisha didn't say, I'm going back home and waiting for that zap. He said there's a mantle to be picked up and he smote the water. And it's interesting that the way they got over the, the, the water was the way that he got back. Mm -hmm. Demonstrating that God was, the Lord God of Elijah was still there, even if Elijah wasn't. Amen. Amen. And what a, wonderful, what a lesson that is to us, that, that the Lord is still there, no matter who goes on and no matter what's happened in the past. And it's not that we discount it and it's certainly not that we disdain it. But what we say is, Lord, 
Do it again, but do greater still this time. Do we have the boldness and the audacity and the, the holy rudeness, if you like, to ask God for a double portion of what the, the men of old walked in? Not just, oh Lord, do it again. We, we just want to see you move before we leave this world for glory. No. Do we have the boldness to say, no, I'm not satisfied. I'm not even satisfied with the Wesley and Whitfield revival. I'm not satisfied with the Welsh revival. I'm not satisfied with the Lewis revival. I'm not satisfied with the reformation of John Knox and the Puritans and the Covenanters in Scotland. That's not enough, Lord. Why? Because it died off. As Kyle was saying, we're, we're saying we're in this place now where that great army has become a field of dry bones. And so we need the revival. But I believe what the Lord is saying to us today is, don't just settle for a quick move of God. Because somebody pointed out to me that day, and it's so true, the Welsh revival was short-lived. Yeah, yeah they, there were repercussions and ongoing things, but the actual revival was short-lived. But this and other places in God's word shows us it's not meant to diminish. It's not meant to ebb. It's not meant to flow away and shrink and wither. It's meant to increase and multiply. You think of those words. In fact, let's just turn there to Isaiah chapter 2. How is this going to happen unless we see continual increase and multiplication of the move of God, the power of God, the glory of God, the anointing? How is this going to happen unless the revival that we're believing for, the move of God, the awakening, the Elijah outpour, whatever you want to call it, or we all have different names for it, and scripture describes it in, in, in different ways, including this one. It says here, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. It shall come to pass. What I like about that is that it says it shall come to pass. It doesn't say if you do this, if we do that. Yea, there are, there are promises in scripture that are conditional. If my people humble themselves, seek my face, Yes, that's conditional, then I'll come and I'll heal their land. But this is not conditional. It just says, it shall come to pass. In the last days, how many believe are in the last days? Yes. It shall come to pass. So God's promise is sure. In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And well, that certainly applies to this place because I drove all the way uphill to get here. <laughs> And shall be exalted above the hills and all nations. How many nations? All, all nations shall flow unto it. And many people, not so, oh, well, you know, we can't expect a lot. We, we, you know, if, we, if we just labor for the Lord and get a few folks saved, we'll be doing well. No, no. God's word says many people. Not some people, not a few, not a handful. Many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths for out of Zion. Out of Zion. The people of the Lord shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now watch this. I, I didn't really intend to touch on this, but I will because how topical is this? How current is this? It says, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, they will disable their nuclear weapons. Amen. They will stop wars in Ukraine, in the Middle East, and all other places. They will use that budget, that war budget, that warmongering budget. They will use all of these, uh, they will beat these things into things that bless humanity, not things that lead us towards nuclear oblivion. It says, nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Hallelujah. What does that tell us? That the glory of the Lord's going to fill the earth. Amen. Now that sounds a lot like revival to me. Yes. Amen. And it's just going to keep on filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. We must believe God for exponential increase of the gospel, for exponential increase of the glory, for exponential increase of all that God is doing in the earth. To the point where rather than people say, I'm going to be, be in queue on Sunday. I'm going to the football on Sunday. Uh, no, they'll say, I'm going to that chapel up in the hills at Harrop Fold. I'm going to that church because those folks have the answer. Now, I believe that that's what revival 
God is speaking about revival here. And that's what we need to believe for. That's what we need to cry out for. That's what we need to expect. When Elijah, when Elijah went off, Elisha could have felt, had a pity party and felt sorry for himself and says, well, that's me. My career is over because the one man who gave me credibility, okay, I've got his cloak, I've got his mantle, but what can I do? No, he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And you and I need to ask today, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Where is the Lord God of George Whitfield, of Wesley, of all the great men, of Ian Paisley and all these men that went before of John Knox, as Norman said. Now, sadly, we're going way back in time for some of these men to look at what they did. But brothers and sisters, it's on you and I now. Yeah. It's on you and I to pick up the mantle. Mm -hmm. It's still lying there, I believe. I believe that's the, the key thing to this. Those mantles that fell. And God is saying to us, I believe, today, pick up the mantle and run with it. And cry out, where is the Lord God of Elijah? In your generation. The Lord bless you. Amen. Thank you very much, Bill. That's wonderful. The challenge this afternoon where is the Lord God of Elijah? He's here, waiting for another Elijah to call upon him. We've been challenged this afternoon, haven't we? To walk in the ways of God and to accept God to move in the mighty way. As we take up the offering, which is very expensive, we'll stand and sing the hymn 496. <laughs> 